why Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. This is part two. Hi, my name is Robert Book. Hopefully you already saw part one, and I'm the author of Shakey's Madness. Um, and in part one, we talked about, isn't this question really about class and snobbery? So I want to address that or finish that thought in this video. Three questions. People ask me this all the time. What do the real Shakespeare experts think? I mean, you're no expert. <laughs> And uh, what's in it for you? Why should you or anyone care about Shakespeare's authorship, or Shakespeare for that matter? And number three, what's in it for Robert Boot? So we'll talk about all these, uh, or answer these questions too. Now we've been told that um, in, or from 1570 to 1579, John Shakespeare lived on Henley Street with his family, and that he allowed William to openly walk to a grammar school. But wouldn't John be afraid to open his door? The historical record shows the sheriff of Warwickshire wanted to capture John. And we can see this here at, um, all right, Shakespeare documented. And we can see all these writs. Hate these things. These uh, writ of uh, attaches, and these things go on and on, um, all through the 1570s through the 1580s, and you can see that for yourself. It reminds me of the time I was going to Las Vegas and I got pulled over for speeding, and uh, the officer approached the window and he said. Do you know how fast you were traveling, sir? And I said, no, sir, I have no idea. And from the back, my son piped up and he said, yes, you did, Dad. You, you told me that you were going 80 just a minute ago. Uh, from the mouth of babes, right? But wouldn't John be afraid his son might be stopped and say something similar like, no, sir, we don't live here. We live over at a farm on Ingon Meadow. You know, the one with the red barn, the second one on the right, that kind of thing. Okay, so what do Shakespeare experts think about my observations? This is the reaction that I've gotten. Now, remember the movie Star Wars when Obi-Wan Kenobi talks to the Star uh, Stormtroopers? So I call it the Obi-Wan Kenobi defense. And they'll say, this is not the John Shakespeare you are looking for. It's someone else named John Shakespeare. See, he didn't live on this farm on Ingon Meadow. He lived on Henley Street. And we can look here. This is called the Combe Conveyance. And it says John Combe acquired uh, these 107 acres of land from Rice Griffin. Remember him? And in 1602, William Shakespeare negotiated with John Combe to purchase it for 107 or 320 pounds, a considerable sum. So, this is not the John Shakespeare you're looking for. And it says that, um, you know, when we add this up, 107 plus 14, that would be like 121 acres. And in John Combe's last uh, will and conveyance, it says that his will alludes to a plot of land called or known by the name of Parsons Close, alias Shakespeare's Close and Bishop's Hampton, uh, blah, blah, blah. No connection is known to the Shakespeare family of Stratford-upon-Avon. Nope, this is just a large uh, body of evidence that Shakespeare was a common Warwickshire surname. That's, uh, that's it. The irritating thing. Okay. 
1592, William Shakespeare loaned John Clapton seven pounds. We know this because in 1600, Shakespeare sued him for seven pounds plus penalty for a total of ten pounds. I mean, usury was illegal, but a 42% penalty was not. Come on. The loan was transacted on May 22, 1592 in the parish of St. Mary Le Beau, Cheapside, London. These are facts of record, right? Okay. What do experts tell us? This is not the William Shakespeare you are looking for. Fact. They claim that everyone knows that it was uh, in another county. You see, William Shakespeare in the Clayton Loan. No, this is Alan H. Nelson again here, and he's saying that, uh, yeah, there was a William Shakespeare who sued John Clayton for uh, seven pounds plus a penalty of ten pounds. But according to the text, you know, the loan was transacted in the parish of St. Mary Le Beau, Cheapside, London. And we all know where uh, Shakespeare was from. He was from Stratford-upon-Avon. So it's the wrong John William Shakespeare. You've got the wrong guy. But didn't we all agree that William Shakespeare left Stratford-upon-Avon to seek his fortune in London? So that would put him in London in 1592. Now my belief is that William Shakespeare was paid in 1592 to use his name by a rich earl who was desperate to send a message to his daughter. But the earl had to remain anonymous. For this reason, in 1592... William Shakespeare, living in London, had the money to loan to John Clay Clayton. Now, what was the rich Earl's message? Hold this thought. I'll get to this a little later. Stylometry and linguistics. Didn't stylometry prove the author really was Shakespeare, who wrote Shakespeare? In fact, you could see it on this uh, YouTube video. It talks all about, it's like a TED Talk, four minutes long. Sorry about this, but it says, uh, some people question whether Shakespeare really wrote the works. Here, I'll save you four minutes. Was Shakespeare real? Yes. It's kind of sad how people don't believe that there are individuals capable of such greatness and all without money, power, and nepotism. Uh, when you try to explain English with math, I'm getting ad attacked here. But, um, yeah, you can see this TED Talk, and they talk all about it. So math and science cannot be wrong, can they? If they say that he was the author, we should believe it, right? Well, might a song written by John Lennon be different than a poem written by John Lennon? And how would a computer know the difference? Oxford's 16 poems are found in a book called A Paradise of Dainty Devices. The book was compiled by the Chapel Royal Master Richard Edwards, who died in 1566, and Paradise contained many songs. So, is it possible Oxford wrote songs? A song found in Romeo and Juliet, When Griping Grief, is found in Paradise. It was credited to the uh, Royal Chapel Master Richard Edwards. Did Richard Edwards know William Shakespeare? Okay, so who was Richard Edwards? This um, this link shows us. It says um, he was an English composer and um, head of the Chapel Royal, or the master of the Chapel Royal. And interestingly, his claim to fame is his play with music, Pal Palamon and Arcite, was performed for the royal visit to Oxford in 1566. Uh, now that's interesting. 
he went to Oxford. Did Richard Edwards know William Shakespeare? Well, if he died in 1566 and Shakespeare was born in 1564, it's pretty unlikely, right? Now, this book is called uh, The Art of English Posy by George Putnam. And in it, when it's, he says right here, it says, uh, The Earl of Oxford and Master Edwards of Her Majesty's Chapel for Comedy and Interlude. So, the Earl of Oxford wrote with Master Edwards. Romeo and Juliet was written in 1595, so what are the odds that Shakespeare would put a song from a guy who died in 1566 into a play in 1595, unless he knew that song? Anyway, a computer always makes the correct comparison, right? I mean, if a computer program compared a song or poem written by you at age 15 with the song or poem written by you at age 45, might they say they were written by two different people? It's possible. The words are data points to a computer, and that's how it interprets them. By the way, has your writing changed from when you were 15 years old? Do you think a computer would know if you were the same writer? Probably not. I know it wouldn't mind, or me. Not sure why this is slowing down here. Oh, the education question is the smoke screen for the real issue class. Remember that? That was the question from part one. Is the fact my wife speaks better Spanish than me really a class issue, or is it a time issue? In other words, if I spent more time speaking Spanish, or if I grew up speaking Spanish and she did not, I would be speaking better Spanish than her, right? It's just a time thing. Edward Vere, we know he spent... He probably had 10,000 hours in on learning Latin because at age four he went to live with the family of this guy, Sir Thomas Smith, who was a Cambridge scholar. He believed it was important for boys to learn Greek first, then Latin, and he drilled him constantly. So this is what he looked like, or this guy over there. Then when uh, Oxford moved to uh, Cecil House, his daily re regimen included uh, an hour of French, an hour of Latin in the morning, and Latin and French in the afternoon. So if you add up all the time, you know, you've got like at least 5,000 hours here just um, looking at his daily regimen. Stratford's education, I I have a question that I cannot answer, and maybe you can find it out for me. Okay, so it has to do with the, uh, the grammar school. And this is something that Shakespeare experts never really tell us. It's just this one little detail. <laughs> okay, how long was a school year back in 1570 to 1580? I mean, when Abe Lincoln went to school, the entire school year lasted just three months. And this was you know, 1820. In 1570, John Shakespeare was the tenant of a 121-acre farm. That is documented. So, would William really have access to any books? Might he be needed on the farm to help out? Remember, this is the acreage. And that was according to the agreement, the sale agreement. Did John Shakespeare move back into town in 1575? This is when he bought the two mess washes, two gardens, two orchards from 1575. This was in October. If you read through this thing, you will see this thing again. 
Okay. So did John move back into town in in fifty in October fifteen seventy five? Um we don't know really. I mean, um it is possible though. And looking at Gilbert Gilbert's signature, it looks like he may have gone to school, but the question is again. When would school start and when would it end? And how long was that school year? Or with six kids, did John Shakespeare remove him from school and hire William out to work at the farm of Anne Hathaway's father? If so, any wages made by the son would become property of the father. But William would have been able to see Anne Hathaway on a more frequent basis. We do know John and Mary Shakespeare were both illiterate, so they were not doing any homeschooling for William. Was his education extensive? That would be a hard no, wouldn't it? Yes. Why is an extensive education so important? Do not people ever pick up knowledge after leaving school? I hear this a lot. Yes, of course they do. But when it comes to reading books in a foreign language in a short time span, then an extensive education is required. I mean, if we only focus on the years 1592 through 1594, here's the chronology per Sir Stanley Wells. This is a really good chronology, too, by the way. I, I agree with um, just about everything. Okay, so let's count be the plays he wrote between 1592 through 1594. We've got one here one here. That's one, two, three, four, five plays. So I'll, I'm good with five plays. But what is missing? Do you see anything missing here? Of course. It's the two long poems. But we also have to keep in mind their source books. And here's my, what I call the Boog chronology. You have to look at the sources too when you look at the work. Because only then will you realize, you know, this guy had to have an extensive education. We're talking about five plays, right? Well, we've got with uh, Henry VI, Hollinshed's Chronicles, if you just use that as the source, that consists of 15 books. I'm not going to add additional sources, but I mean, um, Titus was from book four of, of Metamorphosis. Uh, and we've got Venus and Adonis, that, that was book 10. Holland Sheds, a couple of times. The Rape of Lucrece. So um, we've got all these sources to consider as well as um, the two long poems. And then you've got to wonder, like, why were they written? People tell me Shakespeare wrote the two long poems to gain patronage. Now, my wife could easily read 15 books in Spanish, but me, I'd be struggling to read just one. <laughs> because first I would have to translate it, then I would be able to understand it. But um, you're talking six books here uh, for... And maybe these books aren't really that long, but they're difficult. And that's why it took them so long to translate. <clears throat> You've got Ab Urbe Condita Libri. This is like 35. It, some people say it's 142 books, can, I mean, total. But let's say he just used 12 of them that were, you know, first translated into English in 1600. So he's got to translate these things. The crease was printed on May 15th, 1594. So you'd have to read all the source material before writing, typesetting, and distributing the poem. Venus and Adonis, uh, 1593. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, that just shows you what a poetic genius with a high IQ can do. He can read thousands of words in Latin and pen two long poems perfectly along with five plays. And that, of course, gets my goat. Because if you're a writer, uh, you're most likely thinking to yourself, okay, I get what Boog is trying to say. I get it. All writing requires rewriting. Isn't that true? 
And my point is, there are no mistakes, right? As Hemingway once wrote, the first draft of anything is garbage. The key to great writing is rewriting. And rewriting requires time. Where do you have the time with all this reading and translating? And then you've got a song that shows up in a poem, I mean, in a play you're writing the following year. And yet we notice the Earl of Oxford and Master Edwards, the guy who died in 1566. Now, Oxford was born in 1550, so that makes him 16 years old when he wrote along with Master Edwards. For comedy, he had to write a comedy, an interlude. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, that is the, the thing to me. I mean, ever notice unbelievable things in movies? Like in the movies, you can easily knock someone out with a karate punch to the back of the neck, or um, there's always the perfect parking spot right in front of City Hall. In L.A., this is crazy, right? And you can break into uh, or hack into top-secret government computers easily. And similarly, we have, you know, Oxford and, and Stratford. I mean, Stratford's Latin was small, yet he never makes a mistake conjugating any Latin verbs. He never mistakes pedos with pedos. Um, Stratford cannot read music, but there's a song that was performed before he was born in a play he allegedly wrote, so he uses that song in his play. Come on. And public libraries did not exist in the time of Shakespeare, but William had all these rare source books at his fingertips, and he can just whip right through them. So let's get back to business here. Why were the poems written? Shakespeare scholars claim he passionately wrote Venus and Adonis and Lucrece to impress Henry Rossley and gain his patronage. So, the question is, what happened? Did he get the patronage? And not one letter has ever been found from Henry Rosley to William Shakespeare. Not even a thank you note. Plus, he, he loaned money to John Clayton, so why would William have needed a patron? That doesn't make sense to me either. Okay, so now let's talk about William, or I mean, Edward de Vere's daughter. In 1589, William Cecil was arranging a marriage for Edward de Vere's 14-year-old granddaughter. Elizabeth Vere, Edward's daughter, was not pregnant, at least not yet. In 1589, she was living at Cecil House with her grandfather, William Cecil, and one of his 16-year-old wards. Can you guess his name? Did you guess Henry? Rosley. Henry lived at Cecil House because his father had been beheaded some years earlier by Queen Elizabeth. What if Edward de Vere did not want Elizabeth to marry Henry? This is the theory of author Bonner Miller Cutting, the author of Necessary Mischief, and you can find that book on Amazon. So how would he get a message to her? I mean, if he's denied, William Cecil says, I'm going to tear up every letter that you send. You're not going to get through to your daughter or to uh, Henry. How can he get to him? Well, if you write a great poem called Venus and Adonis, and one of the things that... Um, that you know stands out here is uh, of course the word honor i'm just going to highlight the word honor if we look here you see it like seven times right honor 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 <clears throat> so he's making sure that henry sees that you know you're an honorable guy my friend so I, I'm dedicating this to you. I mean, would you read something dedicated to you that calls you honorable? 
I mean, you might be impressed, right? I mean, um, yeah, nowadays, uh, if you don't get somebody's cell number, you might post something on Craigslist that says your middle name is Irish, your car's name is Rusty, and I met, we met a line at the Hollywood DMV. I lost my cell phone number with your, your number, so I'm sending out this message. It's kind of similar to that, right? You're just a uh, shot in the dark. Okay, so maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you, you're saying to yourself, oh, this is a bunch of crap. I, I don't believe that. Uh, um, you know, I believe the, that uh, William... Shakespeare wrote William Shakespeare, and, uh, you know, he was the superhuman. Uh, so I say just check out the source materials for yourself and look at all of them and see how much you would have to translate. And it becomes like one of these incredible things from a Hollywood movie. There was even a fire that burned 120 houses in Stratford-upon-Avon and several on Henley Street. You don't believe me? Look it. This all happened in... 50, this is September 1594, right? Chapel Street and Henley Street. This is crazy, right? All these things happen in one year. So, with, not to mention reading all this stuff for uh, the rape of Lucrece, and of course um, Venus and Adonis. But wait, there's more. Um, Stratford's name was added to the play role list of players, proving he was a stage director who acted in his plays. Also from the summer of 1594 to March 1603, the Lord Chamberlain's men seem to have played almost continuously in London. Now, am I the only person who doubts that he has the time to do all of this? And this, again, is proof that he uh, is getting paid for these performances, so therefore he's doing it. So why do people doubt his authorship, people like me? He's translating difficult source material in Italian, Latin, and Greek without an extensive education. He pens two long poems without ever making a mistake. He writes at least five plays, possibly helps put out a fire in Stratford, and he is practicing, re rehearsing, and acting in the plays. I call bullshit. Do you see how class has nothing to do with my skepticism? Have people ever covered up for other people? Now I have, uh, you know, what's in it for me? <laughs> I'm selling a book, of course. It's called Shaky's Madness, and you can find it on, a lot of people like it on the audio book. I made it as cheap as possible so that if you wanted to buy it or hear it, you can. Um, basically, most people do not know that during his lifetime, Shakespeare was best known as a poet. And when we view him as a poet, three things light up like a torch on a dark night. Number one, his extensive knowledge of Latin. Number two, the time needed to read and translate the source materials for his poems and plays. And number three, considering the lack of electricity, the time he would need to rewrite. It's crazy. Okay, I'm almost done here. Am I really being a snob or a classist to question the education of William Shakespeare? No. But why would William, uh, Edward de Vere give up his masterpieces to a commoner? Paranoia is a common symptom of bipolar disorder, but there are many creative people who have endured bipolar disorder. A bipolar Edward de Vere makes the study of Shakespeare relevant. BD is more common today, and it might help students to discuss mental health issues. And because Edward de Vere was 14 years older, his authorship makes more sense, because everything doesn't have to happen between just two years. 
he has time to rewrite, in other words. Returning from Italy, Oxford did not speak to his wife for five years. I think he believed she had been raped. By whom? Henry Rosley's father. And that's why he wrote Venus and Adonis and Lucrece. Here is Henry and here is Elizabeth. So, why didn't he want his daughter to marry him? He wanted desperately to stop his daughter from possibly marrying her own stepbrother. It's just a theory, but what would you do if you were in his position? My final observation. If you were an author, would you retire but never tell your spouse about your work? I mean, it, it is obvious that Shakespeare's wife knew nothing about it, so two actors had to collect his plays and then publish them. What the hell? Do people seriously believe this story? Edward de Vere was put in the Tower of London for falling in love with a dark or not fair-skinned woman. Yet nothing happened to Stratford for writing a play starring a black man as a hero with the white man as the villain. Come on. Mental health issues affect all ages, races, classes, and genders. Plus, there is a social stigma attached. Edward de Vere shows us that writing and writing often can often be a tonic or salve from bipolar mania and despair. This is why the study of Shakespeare during the years when bipolar symptoms begin to show is so important. That's really why I'm doing this. See, if you're a college student and you notice that someone is more aggressive and irritable, or they possess lethal means, they say that they're feeling like a burden to others, frequently talking about death. I mean, we now have all these school shootings, and they're related to mental health, and we want to educate our our kids about what's going on. This is the end of the of this video or your start. I hope um, you haven't been bored too much. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, you can find my books and stuff at this website, robertboob.com. And have a great day.